There is no doubting the antiquity of life on Earth as a whole. We can trace back the lineages of a huge range of species, back through the fossil record, to periods vastly predating the arrival of human beings. But at the same time, in the relatively recent past, the species called Homo sapiens appeared on this planet. But while evolutionists persist in the greater joke of tracing human lineage down through a disconnected and convoluted chain of hominid species to a common simian ancestor, what can be established is that full Homo sapiens, modern man, made his earliest mark with the arrival of a people once referred to as Cro-Magnons. The world initially inhabited by this Cro-Magnon people was the world of the Purple Dawn Era. As discussed in the previous episode, an age of darkness spoken of in the myth and oral traditions of the most ancient peoples on Earth. As already discussed, it was a dark world, imbued with only one season, one climate, and absolutely no reference for Cro-Magnons to mark the passage of time. It was also a time when a large chunk of the Cro-Magnons world was covered by an eternal shadow, a great thick dusty aurora covering that pronounced a ribbon-like sheet of ice circumnavigating the Earth's Arctic Circle. It was a time science calls the Plasticine Ice Age. The extent of the Plasticine Ice Age is represented by the larger gray overlay in the photo it clearly shows the Arctic region ice-free, as would have been the case had a sub-round dwarf star existed for a period of time above Earth's North Pole. The smaller green-colored overlay indicates the general coverage of today's aurora bands. Saturn approached the Sun with Earth in its toe, the Saturnian system of planets would have electrically sensed the more positive charge of the Sun's heliosphere, as the electrically alive plasma sheaths of both systems drifted toward each other. The net result would be a surge of enhanced electrical activity throughout the Saturnian system. Its most notable effect on Earth being the emergence of great auroras appearing around the Arctic and Antarctic polar regions. Auroras are a recognized form of plasma, and plasma is known for its ability to attract large concentrations of dust and other particles into cloud-like formations. Due to the close proximity of Earth to Saturn, this aurora would have been highly enhanced compared to the auroras we see today. Enhanced enough to have attracted into a vast ribbon of cloud much of the dust in the Earth's atmosphere at the time. This auroral ribbon of semi-permanent cloud would have corresponded very well to the known areas of glaciations that occurred during the Plasticine Ice Age. The cooling effect of a dust-heavy aurora ring caused by enhanced electrical activity between Saturn and Earth, as Saturn starts to electrically sense the more powerful Sun before its capture. This produced the glacial ice sheets that conform to the known glaciated areas of the Plasticine Ice Age. 
also corresponding to Pleistocene ice coverage. The North Polar region remains ice free, as we learned in Worlds in Collision. Siberia was also ice free due to the concentration of radiated energy arriving from Saturn sitting above the North Pole. The Earth's vegetation takes on a reddish hue, at this time giving Earth its purple-hued look for anyone seeing it from orbit. Common misnomer surrounding the Earth's ice ages is that they initially spread from the poles outwards to the lower latitudes as the global temperature cooled. In fact, one of the great mysteries to modern science is that the greater amount of land found within the Arctic Circle remain ice-free during the Pleistocene Epoch, a finding that is completely at odds with the accepted model for how ice ages start. The islands of the Arctic Archipelago were never glaciated. Neither was the interior of Alaska, wrote R. F. Griggs in an article quoted by Cordona in his book Flare Star, while also quoting Emanuel Velikovsky's reference to J. B. Dana, who wrote, It is a remarkable fact that no ice mass covered the lowlands of northern Siberia any more than those of Alaska. Cordona also quotes the catastrophists D.S. Allen and J.B. Dallaire in their work Cataclysm in making a case for an ice-free Arctic. Ice held most of the northern latitudes in its grip 18,000 years ago, with important exceptions. In the last ice age, glaciers never completely covered eastern Siberia, Alaska, and the Yukon. Plant that beat the Ice Age. National Geographic, March 2001. What this all points to is a source of heat radiating from above the North Pole at a time when Cro-Magnon Man walked the Earth during the Pleistocene Ice Age. A source of heat that is well explained by the presence of a radiating yet dull brown dwarf star that would eventually become the planet Saturn. The ribbon of glaciated ice sheets that ring the Arctic Circle would have formed a natural barrier between flora and fauna, both north and south of this ice ring, with the majority of the Cro-Magnon people settling south of the ice sheets. Yet, it has been long known that a lush vegetation once existed within the Arctic Circle, a fact referred to by the writer William Warren in his search for evidence that man's original mythical paradise had been near the North Pole. The Arctic regions probably up to the North Pole were not only free from ice, but were covered with a rich and luxuriant vegetation. Evidence of early humans has also been found there. It seems Cro-Magnon Man may have braved crossing the broad glaciated barrier and settled in the areas close to the Arctic coast, and possibly even on some of the Arctic islands. Here, tribes of Cro-Magnons would find themselves closer to the source of life that shed its pale light on this purple dawn of mankind. Here, they could have basked under the primordial dark glow of Saturn, even as it drifted unknowingly ever closer to its fateful encounter with the sun. Here was the virtual paradise for mankind, a land filled with rich game and flora, a world immortalized on the walls of caves by their cousins still living south of the ice sheets. Here, then, was the mythical world of the purple dawn of creation. A fight for survival. Such a world as described above can be placed as 
beginning about 30,000 to 40,000 years ago, at least by standard dating schemes, and lasting up until at least 10,000 years ago when Saturn, finally, found itself captured by the Sun. The beginning of the Pleistocene Ice Age coincides with the arrival of Cro-Magnon humans, and its end marks the beginning of the mythical Golden Age. Cro-Magnons lived and died during the intervening millennia, leaving us a magnificent testimony as their existence, painted on the walls of deep caves and subterranean tunnels. During this period, however, Cro-Magnons faced a far more immediate threat to their existence than the depressingly dark atmosphere of the primordial Earth. It was a menace that was to have long-reaching consequences for the collective psyche of humans as a whole, a menace that was something truly frightening. It would precipitate a struggle for survival that amounted to what was an upper Paleolithic World War. The menace in question involved a fight to the death with the leading predator of the age, a creature both cruelly intelligent and immensely strong in darkness. Cro-Magnons found themselves facing their greatest enemy, the Neanderthal. The appearance of Homo sapiens, modern humans, on Earth was heralded by the arrival of desperate groups of people generically referred to as Cro-Magnons. Their world was, at the time, a dark twilight and timeless existence illuminated only by the dull glow of the sub-brown dwarf star called Saturn. A time in which nocturnal animals thrived and the planet found itself in the icy grip of the Pleistocene Ice Age. Contrary to popular belief, much of the Arctic polar region was ice-free. The ice sheets encountered by the Cro-Magnon peoples existed in an eternal shadow, cast by thick dust-laden aurora generated by Saturn's electrical relationship with the Earth. These enhanced aurorae occurred as a result of Saturn's electrical sensing of the Sun's heliosphere as it spiraled even closer to its eventual capture. Similar aurorae existed in the Southern Hemisphere. There is now undeniable evidence for human habitation within the Arctic Circle during the height of the Pleistocene Ice Age, a fact only made possible by the warming influence of Saturn's once radiating energy coming from its northern position where the pole star is today. The period of time in which Cro-Magnon culture dominated stretches by standard dating schemes approximately from 40,000 years ago till 10,000 years ago at which time the Pleistocene Ice Age came to an end as Saturn was captured by the Sun and the Golden Age epoch of the world mythology dawned. During the Pleistocene Ice Age, Cro-Magnons faced the greatest threat to their survival in the form of predatory hominids called Neanderthal. When Saturn met the Sun and its companion, Jupiter. The ancients speak of two distinct epochs for the world on which we live. The world we see today with the Sun and the Moon as our prime celestial masters and a time before that, when the heavens were ruled by the planet Saturn. This previous era is generically referred to in world mythology as the Golden Age, a time when Saturn shone forth as a sun. In its own right, from out of Earth's celestial north to bathe the world in luxuriant and richly fertile warmth, this was Saturn at its zenith, the chief, then chief star god of creation and time our first and best sun. Vestiges of this ancient reality 
are not difficult to turn up. The chief religious festival of ancient Rome was called Saturnalia, and we still refer to the Sabbath as Saturn's Day, or Saturday. But Saturn's golden age did not last. As inconceivable as it may seem to the modern mind, the witness of ancient mythology reveals that mankind suffered a great cosmological upheaval in which Saturn's glorious rule was replaced first by Jupiter and then eventually by the Sun. The consequences of this upheaval has left an incredible mark on the collective human psyche leading to a pervading doomsday anxiety, a fretful psychosis fed by deeply entrenched psychological archetypes that cross all known cultural barriers. In recent years, this pervasive fixation with large-scale catastrophe has nearly become Hollywood's entire stock and trade. Deep down, whatever our cultural heritage, we all share in a seemingly irrational fear of impending catastrophe, a fear born of prehistoric experience that has spawned the dominant themes in our religions, arts, architecture, and even our geopolitical and economic systems. Yet, even before the coming of the Saturnian Golden Age, we hear of a time before time, a distantly primeval world calling to us from out of the universal dream time. These are the fading memories of humankind preserved in the oral traditions of our most ancient races and cultures. Through these dreamtime fragments, we hear echoes of an age spent in darkness, a twilight world existing long before the coming of the sun. We hear of it as a time when the dull primordial half-light of the star god Saturn shifted listlessly on the chaotic celestial waters that enveloped all human existence. Here we find the purple-hued dawn of creation, the time before time began, the time before bright, clear light entered into the world. Through the work of comparative mythologists and more recently the contributions of plasma-based physicists, a new cosmology has emerged that seeks to explain these almost forgotten human legacies. This new cosmology identifies the mythical god Saturn as the primordial sub-brown dwarf star existing and drifting beyond the solar system and accompanied by its own family of satellites. Our Earth was one of these satellites. Safely encapsulated within Saturn's protective and opaque bubble-like plasma sphere. The oral traditions tell us Earth's inhabitants enjoyed a warm yet dully lit environment devoid of any concept of measured time and oblivious to the greater cosmos. In the swirling enveloping chaos that was Saturn's outer plasma sphere, nothing moved with regularity. Saturn's pale disk glowed from a fixed, if listless, position above the Earth's North Pole, the position identified by world mythologies as the abode of the gods. And slowly, yet surely, Saturn and its family of planets unknowingly drifted towards a fateful encounter with a much larger and more electrically dynamic star we now call the Sun. When contact was made between Saturn's own plasma sphere and the Sun's heliosphere, all hell broke loose. Powerful electrical forces surged and discharged, causing Saturn to overload and flare nova-like. In what must have seemed an instant, humankind's previous twilight existence was spectacularly extinguished. 
by a brilliant bright light shining forth from out of the celestial north. Day one, in the epic of a new creation story, had announced itself and humanity now confronted a deeply changed world brimming with visual access to the greater cosmos. Life would never be the same as humankind entered into Saturn's universal golden age, an age that only ended when the sun's overwhelming electrical influence conspired with the planet Jupiter to violently banish Saturn to the outer celestial realms. The great primordial Saturn system of planets was torn asunder and Earth for so long changed in actual alignment to Saturn was freed from its bindings to acquire a new orbit around a new master, the Sun. Such events, mythology tells us, took place roughly 10,000 years ago. Yet, there are two conundrums we face in coming to grips with this radical interpretation of Earth's mythical and cosmological relationship to Saturn. Even if we accept the Saturn originally started off as a free-floating brown dwarf star with an inhabited Earth as one of its satellites, we are faced with the mythological record's insistence that Saturn remained fixed and immobile at Earth, Earth's celestial north. In the same manner, we see the pole star today. While most would offer a phase lock solution to Saturn's perceived immobility, with Earth orbiting Saturn in the same way that the Moon orbits Earth today, this does not explain the latter epoch in which Saturn remained seemingly stacked above Earth while both bodies circled the Sun on its equatorial plane. This forces us to consider Earth as having been in actual alignment with Saturn's southern pole during this time, an arrangement that was most likely a continuance of its existing primordial relationship to Saturn before the latter's catastrophic encounter with the Sun. However, this polar configuration that of planets being stacked on top of one another in actual alignment is viewed as an abomination by virtually all astrophysicists an impossibility given the known tenets of celestial mechanics this then was our first conundrum Saturn theory day at the planetarium the planets Mercury and Jupiter, the latter with its four Galilean moons, orbit the Sun as the actual aligned planets dominated by Saturn approach from below the solar system at roughly 27 degree angle to the Sun's own axis. The scene depicts events shortly before the Sun's electrical field provokes an electrical imbalance in Saturn, causing it to flare Nova-like. The planet Venus is absent at this time, due to it not yet having been ejected by a flaring Saturn, an event that is preserved in mythology as the birth of the goddess Venus. So they marked this event happening with the myth of the birth of the goddess Venus. Check. Then we come to the subject of us, that is, humankind's place in the general scheme laid out by the Saturn theory. More precisely, we are concerned with an assumed origin of human beings on an earth in which ancient world traditions tell us we had once stumbled around in near darkness for a period stretching back into an unknown antiquity, this reported dim 
an inhospitable environment conflicts with the basic idea that a species is generally adapted to their environment of origin. We human beings are creatures fundamentally adapted to function best in a bright environment. This then is our second conundrum. The inescapable conclusion here, the inescapable conclusion was that humans did not necessarily originate on the earth. As a species, we seek the light. Our optimum environment is a bright environment. For humans to be trapped in a permanent gloom where one of our most important faculties is handicapped to the point of near uselessness vigorously militates against the concept of a permanent a permanently darkened primordial earth being our environment of origin so we began to look elsewhere and the journey we undertook eventually led us to a basic question that opened up a huge vista of potential solutions. The question that changed the game was the obvious flip side to it Earth having begun life under a wandering sub-brown dwarf star called Saturn. In the meantime, what was happening around the sun? And was there a brightly lit world on which it was happening? Finding the answer to this question offered more than both of us anticipated. Ted eventually dubbed our subsequent findings to be a prehistory of what he called the antique solar system. A prearrangement of our current solar system sands the planets Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, Mars, Venus, and of course the Earth. Subsequently, the role played by Jupiter during this antique epoch seems to have contrasted sharply with Earth's experience under Saturn. Jupiter's moons also began to take on an increasingly important role in a story that in one of those sweet ironies that only research of this kind can raise up saw two avowed anti-evolutionists, Ted and myself, begin to entertain aspects into the theories of two hardcore evolutionists, Elaine Morgan's aquatic ape hypothesis and Danny Vendram Vendramini's them and us theory of Neanderthal predation on ancient humans. And if that last sentence involving Jupiter's moon swimming humans and ravenous beastly Neanderthals doesn't pique your curiosity, then maybe nothing will. Which brings us back to our first conundrum, namely that of explaining how a planet like Earth could find itself dangling down below a sub-round dwarf star for most of its own distant prehistory. While at first glance this problem seems almost insurmountable from a purely physics point of view, a closer look at observable phenomena would suggest otherwise. By this we mean that there are in fact copious examples of actually aligned objects in our galaxy that offer clues not only to how axial alignments can function, but also as to the nature of how stars and planets are birthed in the first place. However, this is a discussion to take up in more depth in the next chapter, a chapter that will look closely at the role played by the astronomical phenomena called a Herbig Harrow object. Such objects, we will argue, establish the legitimacy of axial aligned celestial bodies in space and provide a solution to the seemingly bizarre relationship between Earth and Saturn in ancient times. For those readers new to the above presented concepts, they could at this point simply choose to reject all cosmological notions of Saturnian planetary systems being captured in the distant past by the Sun and the resulting mythical cataclysmic orgies of destruction, they could simply dismiss the concept of an ancient and dark Saturnian primordial dawn as simply being the fundamental fallacy at the heart of our conundrum 
regarding human origins on Earth. They could offer the observation that daylight must surely have always existed, been a feature in the human experience, and that this is really why we have evolved the way we are. Also, in seeking to reject the evidence presented by the mythological record for a dark primordial environment, they could lay charges that we have willfully misinterpreted mythology to concoct our own flawed literalist dogma at odds with accepting scholastic scientific consensus. To answer such critics, all we can say is read on if you dare and make your criticisms after absorbing the full argument presented in this work. We believe there is much to offer if only for the purpose of constructive debate on the topics that should intrigue anyone searching for an understanding as to where we come from and who we are.